Fixed rides in technology present great opportunities for improvements in financial markets. They also have profound medium and long-term implications. One of those implications is an uncertain future for traditional intermediaries. So, what will their role be in the new hyper-connected world? Joining us to discuss this is Alan Marquard, Chief Strategy and Development Officer at CLS. Welcome to Cybos TV. Hi, good to be here. I mean, Alan, what have you seen as the largest single shift in market behaviour in relation to new technology and direct connectivity? I think it's helpful to look at that in terms of what was easy to get off the ground and is being done already in the background in a, in a lot of services, and then the things that we're building that might be more transformational but take a little longer. So in the short term, everybody knows that there are robotics, AI, AI machine learning, underlying a lot of the interfaces we have. APIs in the world of swift messaging, payments, uh, have been really important, pushing and pulling data. So that's, that's here in making a difference. Um, blockchain, I think, is the one that everybody is pinning their hopes on to really transform how people are connected in the market. And, and blockchain, as you know, its whole premise is that you don't have a hub and spoke anymore. Everybody is distributed, has the same data at the same time. And therefore, there's this idea that you can get rid of the person in the middle. We'll, we'll have to wait and see if that happens. <laughs> Do you think that technology is going to move financial markets away from the use of intermediaries? And if so, in what ways? Uh, where might they remain and why? So I think you're pointing to the right thing that they, they might or, in, you know, I think will remain in certain areas, but they will come under attack in others. So I think a good example of where there is some space for change is if you look at um, uh, transaction banking, correspondent banking, end-to-end -end payments. Um, when someone pays somebody else in another country, there are multiple steps in that chain, each slowing things down, each adding cost, each diminishing transparency of where the payment is. Um, you know, Swift have done a lot of work looking at how to improve that through through GPI and, and other initiatives. I think technology providing that transparency, um, whether that's through APIs or through blockchain, is going to you know, make inefficiencies in that chain come under pressure. And I think some of those intermediaries um, will disappear over time. In other spaces, like with payment systems, uh, and this is a topic close to my heart, because when blockchain burst on the scene 2014, 2015, one of the first things I read was that CLS, you know, as the world's biggest um, foreign exchange settlement system, was going to get taken out and unnecessary expense in the middle. Um, I just absolutely do not think that's going to happen. And the reason for that is that intermediaries are not simply a way of connecting or a technology design. They do a lot of other things. First of all, they are trusted to oversee the operations. So if you think about a blockchain powering financial markets, there's a software upgrade that goes wrong. I mean, it, this thing doesn't exist in the ether. Somebody has to be trusted by the global regulators yeah. to run things so they don't break, fix them, understand how to run operations at scale. And then the regulators want to know who to talk to sometimes nicely, sometimes... <laughs> sometimes not so not nicely. So, not so nicely <laughs> if standards are slipping. Who's ensuring the risk lens and the risk culture around a globally important system? None of that gets taken away by having better technology or direct connection. So I think the models might change around w exactly what the intermediary does. Maybe it doesn't have to take the payments in and out Maybe it becomes more of an operator function, but they absolutely will not disappear. Mm. It's interesting you've talked there about the models because that leads quite nicely onto my next question, but looking at it from the perception of models and relationships, because we know, for example, that fintech and financial institutions, they've generally had a pretty complementary relationship. But when you look at big tech, it's obviously got deep pockets and 
a base which is largely retail. So how do you see these relationships changing given the big tech invasion? I'm very glad that you started by pointing to the relationship between fintechs and incumbents. Because everybody likes a story. And when fintechs first sort of bubbled up, it was painted very much as the war of the, the you know, the small, agile, consumer-friendly, garagist technologist that was going to take down the banks. That very quickly, I think, crumbled as a model, because as you said, you know, incumbents have funding, they have network, mm. and no matter how good your idea is, at some point you're going to need those two things if you're going to matter. And so we've seen lots of consortiums start up, with fintechs, bank syndicates working together to find solutions. That's been really healthy. Now we have big tech come along, and so is it again we're painting this as a war to make a story, or is it, is it really a war? I think there's a bit of both. So the first thing that those big providers have done in financial services is, is the provision of this change to cloud services. And that's had a massive impact in a positive way because that's still big tech providing tech, if you will. But when you have things like Facebook's Libra that it's announced, that's now starting to get into the actual financial services activity of payments. That could be a collision course um, between the, the bank and banks and their interests yeah. and, uh, and what, what Libra could provide. I, I think for the reasons I said earlier that it's very easy if you're a tech company to come at financial services problems with a tech lens. Mm. And I think as you would have seen in some of the <laughs> hearings that, that Mr. Zuckerberg attended uh, and from the statements from the Swiss regulators, for example, about how they might look at something uh, like Libra, that they're going to be stepping into the world of payment systems and payment system regulation. Mm. And I can tell you as a you know, a systemically important financial market infrastructure that's overseen by 23 central banks sitting in, in college, that it's no sort of tech startup joyride having that kind of responsibility. And so I think big tech is going to discover that along with the profitability and opportunity that comes from stepping into financial services, they're gonna, there's going to be a lot of oversight and overhead. Yeah, the responsibility, basically. That, um, that they've probably never experienced before. Which at a macro. You step in. <laughs> I'd say, uh, at a macro level, what do you see the traditional intermediaries doing to respond to this seismic shift in market structure? I, I think in some areas with the banks, um, there's an attempt to, to be part of the game. So we have seen consortiums start up that are looking at digitizing payments, for example. Um, players like uh, Finality, um, R3, and others that, that have value on Ledger as a proposition. So I think that they're trying to, to keep a pace uh, in that way. I think for the financial market infrastructures, the real intermediaries in the middle, I think not a lot is actually being done. And I think the reason for that is, is twofold. So it's not, I don't think it's necessarily a negative story. The first thing is that the way intermediaries are classified and expected to operate is very much along the lines of the activity with the markets, the models, sorry, that are in the market now. So CCPs are CCPs, payment systems are payment systems and don't have the license to just say, well, we're just going to do it on blockchain and change our business model tomorrow. That's just, you know, we're keeping the world safe. Uh, and neither the regulators nor we would be comfortable just throwing that away. But the reason I don't think it's, it's necessarily a bad thing is, as I said earlier, the models that big tech that, and that technology is empowering are still developing. In every instance that I have seen, those models lead back to needing financial market infrastructures in some way or another. As CLS, you know, notwithstanding the headlines about we being disrupted by uh, everybody and their cousin, 
there's pretty much not anyone over the last few years, and I'd say with the exclusion of Libra, that we haven't engaged with pretty closely um, looking at should we collaborate, would there be a, a right time, can we help each other. We're in those conversations because everybody gets to that point where they realize if this proposition of ours is going to actually work at scale, we're going to need credibility and experience. And the financial market infrastructures is where you find it. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the financial market infrastructures can afford, so long as they're not being ostriches with their head in the sand, they can afford to wait longer to see how this plays out. I mean, in some ways, you've actually answered the next question that I was going to put to you, in fact, because it is how intermediaries are going to respond in this market so that everybody can get involved because you've got very high barriers for entry. Yep. And from what you're saying, it, it's a case of, look, we, obviously we can't behave like ostriches, but in a way, you, you, you almost have to wait for that light bulb moment to switch on for the large tech companies because they, they really can't survive without you. They need someone to navigate them through this changing regulatory landscape. You guys have got the experience. You know how to do it. So I, I couldn't have put that any better. You know, I, I, I do self-check myself once a week. Am I being an ostrich? You know, am I being arrogant thinking you can't take us out and next thing I'm Kodak? Yeah, we're acutely aware of that. And for that reason, we thought it um, fundamentally important to be involved in the technology. So what we did uh, as CLS, we um, established a netting service. Why is that important? Well, payments really, really, really matter. You know, we, we settle around six trillion a day in our system, 12.8 on one day last week. That really matters, that can't break. That's not where guinea pigs come to play. Um, but we absolutely see that the blockchain could be used for payments in the future. So how do, what do we do with the technology to be in it but not putting things at risk? A netting service, which is a, a calculation service to help standardize the market but doesn't actually move the money, we thought was a great place for us to learn how to run the technology and be in the conversations around blockchain. So in fact, that service is just about the only production service in financial services that is running at an enterprise level now. Our netting service is up and running and it's, it's on a blockchain. Mm. That has put us in the conversation so that we're not ostriches and that we're conversant with developments in the technology and can pick our moment when we think we need to you know, open the nodes to all the banks, um, start thinking about value on the ledger, whatever the next step is going to be in that journey, we're there. Mm. Okay, so in a world of increased regulatory oversight and scrutiny, how are regulators ensuring appropriate risk mitigation at the moment? Mar market resilience and global oversight in this evolving, changing environment? I, I th think, without overstating it, that to some extent they're struggling. You know, tech, the speed of the tech car and the regulation car are not necessarily the same. <laughs> um, uh, I think there have been some real efforts to think about um, how to regulate technology. Uh, and the outcome of that has been, you can't regulate technology. Mm -hmm. You have to regulate the activity and yeah. see technology as an enabler. So those are very sound principles of how you regulate. But I do think that these things start fudging a little bit. I mean, if I look at, at cloud provision, for example, um, that is a technology provision. And you could say, if you're a market player or an infrastructure and you put things on the cloud, you're accountable to your regulators as if that was your tech stack and you have to make sure it works and meets your security requirements. In theory, that makes sense. But what, what happens when you're, you know, I don't want to pick AWS or Azure or anyone else, but any huge provider and half the financial system is now sitting in, you know, in your data centers, on your servers. That starts feeling as important as a global CCP or a payment system. It's the same car crash if it goes wrong. Um, 
So I don't know how long we, we're going to sustain that principle of the activity and the technology are different things. And, and I think that we really need to accelerate the amount of dialogue between infrastructures and regulators about where those regulators are, not placing their bets, but what they, what they see the role of infrastructures being in the future and how that integrates with technology. I want to pick up on something which you referred to earlier. This was your netting service and fuse it with a concept called the future. Let's look ahead to the next 10 or 20 years time, given everything that you're doing now and the forecast that you've given us about the future, this relationship between big tech and the intermediaries, where do you see your role in 10 or 20 years time, given that, okay, blockchain is the talking point for today's conversation, but we know that technology isn't static, so blockchain could be obsolete in 10 or 20 years time. Where does this leave you and the netting service? <laughs> Too old and uh, too <laughs> non-clairvoyant <laughs> <laughs> to really know. But my best guess would be, um, I think CLS will absolutely still be there. And one of the reasons for that is for all of the, the things we do in risk mitigation and you know, reducing the, the funding strain on the market by 96 to 99%, all very helpful stuff. But the real secret source of CLS is that we were set up in a time where the market came together, global regulators. I don't know that you could do that if you tried to do it now. I don't think regulatory cooperation is in the same place. So we are lucky that we have this position of global cooperation amongst regulators and market participants built around us. That, that's a very strong ecosystem. And like I said, not to sound arrogant, but I, I do think that those tech developments are going to keep coming back to the bit that they can't create. Mm. So I think whether we're running the world's biggest distributed ledger or whether we um, are doing some kind of direct peer-to-peer -peer payment, um, working under oversight of regulators but not in their local payment systems, all of that is possible. But I genuinely, genuinely believe that the world will gravitate back to, to using a trusted intermediary like us. Absolutely. Well, we look forward to finding out, hopefully, with as few ostriches as <laughs> possible. <laughs> Alan Marquardt, Chief Strategy and Development <laughs> Officer at CLS. Thank you very much for joining us Thanks. on Cybos TV. It was great Thank to be you. here. Excellent. <laughs>